And I want to encourage you to take some good notes tonight. Because we're talking about trusting God in difficult times. Now tonight is part four of this series of trusting God in difficult times. You know, the Holy Ghost, the Bible said, Jesus said that the Holy Spirit, He will take the things of Christ and He'll show them unto us. He said that the Holy Spirit would bring everything to our remembrance. But now listen to this. He said He will also show you things to come. He will show you the future. Brother Hagin, my, my spiritual father, used to say, he would pray, Lord, prepare me for the things that you have prepared for me. Well, I think also we need to say, Lord, prepare us for that which is before us. Because only God knows the end from the beginning. How many know that the Lord knows what next year holds? Or the next five years or the next ten years? And he will help us to be prepared. He will help us prepare for any test or trials or difficult things that lie before us. Now, I want you to listen carefully to the Word of God tonight as we continue in this series about trusting God. Turn with me, please. In Proverbs 22, I'm going to read from the Amplified Classic, verses 17 through 21. Proverbs 22, 17 through 21 in the Amplified Classic. It says, Listen. Consent and submit to the words of the wise and apply your mind to my knowledge. For it will be pleasant if you keep them in your mind, believe in them, your lips will be accustomed to confessing them. How many of you have got your lips accustomed to confessing the truth of God's word? It's no longer something that you force yourself to do. But now you become accustomed and your mouth just automatically begins to say, this is what the Word says. Amen? Amen. He goes on to say, so that your trust, belief, reliance, support, and confidence may be in the Lord. I have made known these things to you today, even to you. Have I not written to you long ago excellent things and counsels and knowledge to make you know the certainty of the words of truth that you may give a true answer to those who sent you. Listen to me. A true answer to every question is found in the Word of God. Amen? Amen. The Bible says that we'll have this hope within ourselves that we'll be able to answer every man for the hope that lies within us. People ask you, why are you so happy all the time? Why are you smiling? Why, why are you always talking about being blessed? Why are you prosperous when others aren't? You need to be ready to give them an answer. Amen? And the truth of that is in God's Word. But I want you to look especially at the part where he says in verse 19, so that your trust, belief, reliance, support, and confidence may be in the Lord. In Proverbs 30, verse 5, the Bible says, Every word of God is pure. Say it with me. Every word of God is pure. Now, if you look that word up here in the Hebrew, it's talking about when you put gold or metal in the fire and it's purified, it's tested for its worth. That's exactly what it's talking about. Every word. Y'all remember we talked about this earlier. I don't, I don't want to go backwards, but I just I mentioned this. You remember the word that came to Joseph was tried, the psalmist said? The word that came to Joseph concerning the dreams that he had? The plans, the future that God had for him was tried. That's what this word is talking about. Every word of God is pure. It's been tested and it's been it's purified. Now, he goes on to say, He is a shield unto those that put their trust in Him. God is a shield to those that trust in Him. I'm telling you, listen to me, just like... Uh, I don't mean to be humorous at all, but you remember how Superman... He could stop a speeding bullet. Imagine the shield of God. Stop a, a speeding bullet. Stop a speeding car. God is a shield to those that trust Him. We need to, we need to start thinking bigger and start believing for the supernatural that nothing by any means can harm us. That Jesus said when He, he meant what He said, listen to me, when He said, listen, I give you authority over all the power of the enemy, nothing by any means can harm you. You need to believe that. That nothing by any means can harm me, my wife, my children, my grandchildren, my family. Nothing will be able to harm me. Amen. Do you not think that the devil's going to try to do harm? 
The Bible tells us that he is our adversary, that he goes to and fro in the earth, seeking whom he may devour. He literally wants to devour you, to destroy you. He is the destroyer. Amen? But God says that he's a shield to those that put their trust in him. Now, for those who have taken notes, this word trust comes from a Hebrew word that means to flee to for protection. We need to learn to flee or run to God for protection. When you realize there's a storm coming, and I'm not talking about just a physical storm like a hurricane or a tornado. I'm talking about a spiritual storm, an attack coming upon your life. You need to run to the Lord. Don't run from him. Run to him. As far as that goes, when you're in any kind of trouble, when you realize you're being tempted to sin, or even if you have yielded to the temptation to sin, run to God. Never run from him. Never hide from him. You can't hide anything from him anyway, right? No, you should try it. Run to him because he's going to forgive us. He's going to bless us. But now let's move on. Psalm 5, verse 11. In Psalms 5, 11, the Bible says, Let all those that put their trust in thee, rejoice. How many put your trust in God? Amen. Now, let's stop right there for a moment, okay? Let all those that put their trust. That tells me that this is a choice that we have. Right. That we can put our trust in God, or we can put our trust in man, or in something else or someone else. It's a choice that we have every day. Who are you going to trust? Are you going to put your trust in God? It reminds me of making a deposit in a bank. You get to choose what bank you want to make your deposits in, right? You can put them over here, or you can put your deposits over there. You can put your trust in God, and the Bible says let those that put their trust in God, listen to me now, rejoice. Why? You have something to rejoice about, not to be arrogant of. You know, I was sitting here thinking while we were worshiping the Lord, Somebody told me before service about several people, you know, in another church and somewhere else that uh, have a been tested positive for coronavirus. And I was just thinking as I was worshiping the Lord, and I was just thanking God for his divine protection of how he's watched over us and he's blessed us. And I am not in the least bit arrogant about that. I humble myself before God because I know that it's God's protection. It's he that keeps me. Amen? It's God who watches over me. And he'll do the same thing for anybody who will put their trust in him. See, I put my trust in the Lord to protect us from the coronavirus or any other virus or any other sickness or disease or attack of the enemy. So he said, let them rejoice. Let them ever shout for joy because you defend them. Shout for joy because the Lord defends us. Hallelujah. Glory to God. You know, you've got a parent, and you've got a child that drives. You're a parent, and you have a child that's driving. And you get up early in the morning, and the child's already left to go to school, and all of a sudden you hear they has been a wreck on the highway, and you know that your child travels, travels that highway. You just get up and start shouting, it can't be my child because the Lord takes care of us. You know, start worrying, wondering, calling, is it my child? No, we know it's not. You know, several years ago, this had been a long time. Holly was in high school. And there was another girl from Kershaw by the same name. And we got up that morning and we found out that there had just been an accident and a girl by the same name as our Holly had, was she killed or just badly hurt? She was killed, wasn't she? Yeah. Well, we knew immediately. It's not our daughter. It may be somebody, it has to be somebody else's. It's not ours. Oh, yeah, people were calling us, consoling us, you know, wanting to know more information. Yeah, yeah, people wanting to bring food and stuff. They'd already heard about it, and they thought it was our daughter, not ours. You say, now, are you saying that braggingly? No, very thankfully, very humbly, I thank God. Why? Because God said, everybody say God said. God said, God said the angels of the Lord encamp around about those that fear the Lord to deliver them. He said, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. Every tongue that rises against you and the judgment you shall condemn. Amen? So he said, he defends us. That word defend in Hebrew, it means to hedge about, to fence about, to cover over. Let's look at Job 1.10 for a moment. 
Let's look at Job 1, verse 10. Y'all remember how that, let me point something out to you from the young literal Hebrew. When Satan came before the Lord, God asked him, the young literal translation says, how have you set your heart upon my servant Job? Now, when you read it from the King James, it sounds almost like God sick the devil on Job. How do you know that God's not in the business of sicking the devil on on his children, right? No, he asked him, have you, have you set your heart upon my servant Job? And the devil began to make excuses as to why he thought that Job was serving him. You blessed him. And look what he says. Has not thou made a hedge about him? God defended him, in other words. About his house, about all that he has on every side. Thou hast blessed the work of his hand. His substance is increased in the land. In other words, Satan himself acknowledged that God defends his children, his, those that serve him. Amen? You say, well, what about what happened to Job? Well, while we're here, let's just go ahead and deal with it. Go to Job 3, 24 and 25. I'm telling you, listen to me. If you are going to be protected in difficult times, then you're going to have to obey the Lord. You're going to have to listen to what God is saying. You need to be led by the Holy Spirit, and you need to practice being a doer of the word. Do not open the door for the devil. If you couldn't open the door to the devil, then why does the Bible say give no place to the devil? Huh? If you couldn't give him a place, why does the Bible command us not to? Why does the Bible say resist the devil if he can't attack you? Because he can, he can resist, he can attack you, and he will, but if you resist him with the word, then he cannot overcome you, he cannot defeat you. Now, look at this. Job said, For my sighing cometh before I eat, my roars are poured out like the waters. The next verse, The thing which I greatly feared is come upon me. The thing which I greatly feared has come upon me. The Hebrew literally says, I feared a fear, and it came upon me. I feared a fear. What is a fear? It is a spirit. God has not given us a fear to fear. It is a spirit. And when you fear that spirit, when you fear that fear, you open the door. Fear works just like faith, except it works in the opposite. Fear is having faith in the devil. Come on, y'all. I'm trying to help y'all. As your pastor, I want you to be ready. For any attack that comes your way, I want you to be ready. That you'll never get into fear. One of the reasons I'm always encouraging all of you, is to deal with the fear head on because if you don't, you're going to open a door one of these days. Right. Don't be afraid of a dog or a horse. Don't be afraid of a snake or a spider. Don't be afraid of a large open space or a tight closed-in space. Don't be afraid to get on an airplane. Don't be afraid of heights or depths or widths or anything else. Don't be afraid of nothing. Why? Because God didn't give you a spirit of fear. If you have one, who gave it to you? Where did it come from? It comes from the enemy, right? So, let's move on. Say it out loud. God did not give me a spirit of fear, so I refuse to receive one. In Jesus' name. And if there is one, resist it and rebuke it and deal with it. Overcome it. Hallelujah. Now, we told you Jesus made this statement. In John 16, 33, in the world... He said, you're going to have tribulation, right? Now, I told you, he went on to say, be of good cheer. Why? Because I've overcome the world. Yes. Now, for those of you that not, might not have been here or wasn't listening good, the word tribulation comes from a Greek word, thalipsis, and it means a pressing or pressure being put upon. Translated trouble, tribulation, affliction, but it literally means pressure or a pressing upon. When there is a pressing upon your mind, if you don't deal with it, you will get into depression. Right? He said, this pressure comes from the world. It comes from the enemy. He said, but you don't have to get in fear. He said, because I have overcome the world. And because he overcame the world, we can overcome the world. Now, for those of you that were not here, I shared with you the Stockdale paradox named after Jim Stockdale who was a prisoner of war for eight years in Vietnam. He said, you must retain faith that you will prevail in the end, and you must also confront the brutal facts of your current reality. Your current 
reality. Remember this, always, always keep the faith. Have faith that at the end of the battle, at the end of the storm, at the end of the attack, you are going to win. You are going to come out on top. Why? Because your trust is in the Lord. And you know that God is with you. Right? And if God is with you, who can be against you? In other words, who can overcome you? If you know that God is on your side and you are trusting God. He said, number one, know that you're going to win, prevail at the end. Number two, he said, at the same time, you're going to have to confront the brutal facts of your current reality. Okay, so let's face the facts for a moment. You may have been diagnosed with a sickness or disease. It may even be incurable. You may be facing bankruptcy or foreclosure on your home. You may be on the edge of divorce or at a loss concerning a rebellious child. You could be on the edge of a nervous breakdown because of all the pressure that you're dealing with, all these other things that I just mentioned. And, of course, it could be a hundred other things, the brutal facts. But let me ask you something. Is there anywhere in the Word of God that tells us that the righteous, the just, God's people are supposed to be moved or controlled by the facts? You see, there are people who say, well, you are not a realist if you simply refuse to accept the facts. Now, listen, it's a different thing to face the fact than to accept the fact. Did you hear what I said? God has always wanted us to face the facts, but to face it with the truth of his word. Amen? 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 So first of all, I want you to remember, Jesus warned us all these things were going to happen, right? Paul warned us it was going to happen, difficult times, perilous times in the last days. Next of all, let me remind you again, Jesus said, cheer up, which means to be encouraged. Why? He said, I've overcome the world. He said, my Father is greater than all. Do you believe that Jesus Christ is not only your Lord and Savior, but that you and he have the same Father? Do you believe that? Amen. I've shown it to you in Hebrews 2.11. We are of the same source. We have the same origin. We have the same Father. Therefore, he is not ashamed to call us his brethren, his brothers. We're related. How? Through the blood. And we overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Jesus said, my Father is greater than all. He's greater than any cancer. He's greater than any sickness, any disease, any mountain, any problem. He's greater. Hallelujah. And you need to know that. And you need to start saying that out loud. Not just that Jesus said my father is greater, but that you know that he's your father and that he's greater than anything that you will ever face. And he's going to help you to overcome. Okay? Now, one thing you've got to do in the midst of difficult times, is you've got to stay focused on the right things. It is so vital that you keep your focus in the right place on the right things. Look with me in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 18. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 18. I want you all to be thinking about anything in your life, a fact, that needs to be faced and confronted and overcame. Any test, any trial, problem, difficult time, trouble, affliction, pressure, that you're, it's in your life right now. I want you to think about that. You need to make a note of it because in the days ahead, you are going to deal with it and overcome it. Amen. Do you hear what I said? You're going to deal with it and you're going to overcome it. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. I want, I want to say something here, and I don't want anybody to get offended. Blessed is he who's not offended in me. Amen. Offense, as we're going to see later, maybe even tonight, is the bait of Satan. It is a trap that you step into when you get offended, and now the devil's got you right where he wants you. You know, people, when this coronavirus first started, you all remember how crazy things got last year, early last year. 
And uh, people would ask us, people would message us, do we need to wear a mask to church? Do we need to be vaccinated? We told everybody the same thing. Be led by the Holy Spirit. Because, see, I don't want you to be, uh, I don't want you to accuse me and blame me for something of, because of the decision that was made in your life and things don't go the way you want it to go or thought it should go. And then you turn around and say, well, pastor said don't wear a mask. Pastor said don't get vaccinated. I never said any of those things. Right? We told everybody, be led by the Holy Spirit. We want you to be comfortable. If you want to come in the back, if you want to get vaccinated, wear a mask, sit in the back, that's fine. Okay? Or if you want to come in here, that's fine. We don't want anybody to be under condemnation. But here's the thing. A lot of people have wondered, Pastor, why don't you wear a mask? I don't need to wear a mask. <laughs> Y'all listen to me. If, if God was to tell me right now to go into a, let's just say some, you know, plague-stricken nation where bubonic plague broke out like it did one time in South Africa. John G. Lake went into the midst of all those people dying by the thousands everywhere. He refused to take any kind of shot. He didn't take any type of prevention. And when the doctors were amazed why he didn't even get the least bit sick, they began to ask him about it. And he said, the Bible says in Romans chapter 8, he said in verse 2, the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. I want you to have this revelation. I want you, 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 every one of you, every one of you, I want you to get this revelation that the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made you free from the law of sin and death. It is the law of sin and death that kills and destroys. But if you're free from it, then it can't kill you, it can't destroy you. You got that. Come on now. Did I say you shouldn't wear a mask? Did I say you shouldn't get vaccinated? I didn't say that, did I? I'm telling you, be led by the Holy Ghost. Be led. And not just in that, but in everything. Be led by the Spirit of God. Hallelujah. Amen. See here, look at this. The Holy Ghost is speaking through the Apostle Paul. He's writing. And he says, while we look not. Everybody say, look not. look not. Stop right there for a moment. That word look means to take aim at, to fix your eyes upon, to direct your attention to. He says, we do not set our eyes upon, direct our attention to. We do not focus on the things which are seen. He said, the things which are, but the things which are not seen. Everybody say, not seen. Not seen. How can you look at something not seen? You can only do it with the eyes of faith. You cannot look at something that you can't see in the natural. It is only with the eyes of your faith when you see the promises of God, you know the promises of God, you've got them fixed in your heart, you've got them fixed in your mind, and with your faith, you are looking at the promise. He said, don't focus on the wrong thing here. Don't focus on what's going on in the world, in the natural. Don't focus on the problem, the test, the trial. Don't focus on the pressure and all that. Look at what you can't see. Amen. Why? Because the things that you can see are temporal, which means temporary, subject to change. Everything that's, listen to me, everything you can see with your natural eyes and feel with your natural feelings, hear with your natural, all of that is subject to change. It's temporary. But, watch this, the things that are not seen, they're eternal. They're not going to change. The Word of God is forever. The Word of God is eternal. Forever, O oh Lord, your Word is settled in heaven. Right? So what are you supposed to be focusing on? Do you focus on the test that the doctor just pulled out and showed you? Huh? Do you focus on what he said about the symptoms? Do you focus on the negative things that you've heard from the world? No, no. Folks, as a child of God, we're to set our minds, our attention on the promises of God, on what God has declared, what God has said. He said, you're healed. Oh, if everybody in this church would get this. The only time we'd have to minister to the sick would be new people coming in. 
He said, listen, by the stripes of Jesus, you were. If you were, then you are. Now, let's, let's move on. Watch this now. I want you all to get this because the devil, he says, let me direct your attention to the facts of the situation. I mean, he's real good at that. Let me remind you of what the doctor said. Let me remind you of what happened in your marriage yesterday. Let me remind you how you acted last week. Oh, he's good at drawing your attention to the facts, the circumstances, right? But God says, don't you do it. No, no, no. Now, you say, well, are you telling me to ignore the facts? Have I said one time that you're supposed to ignore the facts? You're supposed to confront the facts. You're supposed to deal with the facts. You're supposed to face the facts, but you do it with your trust and faith in God, knowing that faith is greater than facts. And that, listen to me, your faith can literally change the facts. Hallelujah. All I'm telling you is don't focus on the facts. Don't focus on the thing that that you can see. Focus on the not seen. In other words, Focus on the things that are, this is the way the Holy Ghost spoke it to me, not discernible to the senses. Focus on the things, the promises of God, they are not discernible to the senses. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. Let's put this up for everybody to see. Now the King James says, for the just walk by faith, not by sight. Now put it up in the NLT if you have the NLT or the NET. Watch this now. For we live by believing and not by seeing. Do you have the NET now? And after that, if you put it in the Passion Translation. All right, put it in the Passion Translation. We live by faith, not by sight. Sight, that is a reference to the physical senses. We live by faith, not by what we see with our eyes. Think about this, folks. Not by what you see. Not by what you feel. You know, Smith Wigglesworth used to say, I'm not moved by what I see. I'm not moved by what I hear. I'm not moved, talking about in the natural. I'm not moved by what what I feel. I'm not moved by the circumstances. I'm moved by the Word of God and by the Holy Ghost. Remember I shared with you last week when Paul was talking about the afflictions and the pressure that the people of Thessalonica were, 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 were suffering from and the things that he himself was facing. He said, none of these things move me. None of these things move me. Now, folks, it takes, it takes spiritual maturity to get to that place where you can literally say, without having just to say it by faith, but now it is a faith fact that you are not moved by none of those things. You're not moved. You're not, you don't get any fear. You don't worry about it. You don't get upset. You're just absolutely not moved. God never intended for his people to be controlled by their emotions. What if you had automatically... Something that showed an emoji on your forehead based on your emotions at the moment. It just automatically popped up. (laughs) What kind of emoji would everybody be seeing all day long? Huh? Hopefully they just see one that's just happy and at peace and smiling all the time, you know. But I seriously doubt if that would be the case with most people. Amen? Amen. God doesn't want us controlled by our emotions. He doesn't want us controlled by our flesh. He doesn't want us controlled by feelings and so on and so forth. Now, when the Bible says to just walk by faith, not by sight, the word faith is a conviction or a persuasion of the truth. Now, I want you all to get this. When you're walking by faith, you're walking by a conviction or a persuasion of the truth. What is truth? Huh? What is truth? Think about it. Even Pilate wanted to know what is truth. Jesus said, Father, he said, your word is truth. Sanctify them by your word. Sanctify them by thy truth. I believe it's, uh, uh, Marilyn, put up John 17, 17. I, I'm not sure. Let's just see. When Jesus was praying and he said to the Father, that's it. 
sanctify them, separate them, set them apart. How? Through truth. And what is truth? It's God's Word. What separates us from the world? What separates us from people that are filled with worry and fear? Even other believers, even other Christians. What separates? What makes us different? We're separated by the truth of God's Word. We're not moved by bad news. That's exactly what Psalm 112 is talking about. The righteous, the just, they're not moved by evil tidings, which means they're not moved by bad news. Like that bad news that came that morning when that young lady was killed who had the same name as our daughter. We was not moved when people started calling the house concerning that. Because we knew it couldn't be true. Y'all remember me telling y'all about, uh, help me remember this, uh, Alexander, the guy that did the cannon jars. Huh? Yeah, Alexander Kerr, K-E-R, thank you. Now, when he started that, that cannon jar business in San Francisco, he was just your typical average Christian, but he wanted to be blessed and he wanted to be a blessing. That should be the motive for every one of us. God, I want you to bless me because I want to be a blessing, right? And so he started that business and it grew and grew and grew because he was a tither and he began to, you know, uh, he actually put a track concerning tithing in every case of jars that he sold. It became the largest uh, business of its kind in the United States. When the great San Francisco earthquake hit, his business was the most flammable business in the whole city of San Francisco because they had to keep those vats so hot to melt the glass, you know, and all to make the glass. He was out of town when the earthquake hit. He received a telegram telling him for how many miles and how many thousands of buildings all around were being destroyed. They couldn't even get, his people couldn't even get to the plan itself. But when they told him, your, your building is no doubt destroyed because everything within so many uh, mile radius is, is burnt to the ground, destroyed. He said it can't be. He said it's impossible. It cannot happen. Why? Because he said, God said, bring all the tithe. He said, and I, he put me to the test. If I want to open the windows of heaven, pour you out a blessing. And he said, I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. He said, it is absolutely impossible for my plant, my factory, to be hurt. When they finally could get there, everything around it was burnt down and destroyed. The fire came up to the border of his property and stopped all the way around. Never crossed onto his property. Not one blade of grass was burnt. The building wasn't touched. Not one jar was even cracked. Imagine that. Go back and read up for yourself about it. So I'm telling you, when you have faith in God and you really trust in him, God is going to protect you. He's going to watch over you. He's going to deliver you. And he's going to continue to bless you in the midst of the storm. Amen? Amen. So, don't be moved. But what you see here, feel, are the circumstances. Now, for those of you taking notes, I want you to write this down. I heard the Holy Ghost say this. The purpose of tribulation or pressure is to knock you off balance. The purpose of tribulation is to knock you off balance. Y'all remember Jesus warned Peter. He said, uh, Satan has desired. This is over in Luke chapter 22, verse 31. He says, Satan has the desire to have you that he may sift you as wheat. But then he went on and told him, he said, I prayed for you that your faith won't fail. Now think about this. The devil wants to shake you. He wants to agitate you until you fall apart. How many times have you felt like pulling your hair out? Huh? Where did that come from? It's pressure. From all the problems, everything going on, going wrong. And you heard it said, you may probably said it yourself before. I just feel like pulling my hair out. Why? Because all the pressure that's building up right here. That's what the devil wants to do. That word self means to agitate, shake, agitate, 
That's exactly what he wants to do. He'll use people. He'll use circumstances. He'll use anything he can to get to you. And that's right. You've got to make a decision. I choose to walk in love. I choose to walk in the Spirit. I choose to walk by faith. Make a decision every day how you're going to live your life. And you're not going to let the enemy control you with things that are coming at you. Okay? Now, he said, I pray that your faith won't fail. That word fail means to cease or to stop working. If Jesus prayed for Peter's faith that it would not stop working, then that tells me that it's possible for my faith or your faith to stop working. For example, faith worketh by love. Faith worketh by love. Love energizes. Work is a word that means to energize in the Greek. Faith is energized by love. So when you're stepping out of, out of love, guess what? Your faith stops working. When you begin to speak contrary to what God says, your faith stops working. Why do you think the Bible says hold fast to confession of your faith without wavering? He says a man that does that, he's a double-minded man, and let not that man think that he shall receive anything from the Lord. In other words, what you say tonight in church is what you need to say tomorrow at work or in front of your family or friends. You wouldn't hesitate in front of everybody here to get up and say, God didn't give me a spirit of fear. I'm delivered. I'm healed. I'm free. I'm not going to have coronavirus. But would you do the same thing in front of family and friends or coworkers when they started talking about it? You see, because a lot of time, most religious folks, they're afraid to say something like that. They're afraid to say, well, I'll never be sick. Why? Because they're afraid the devil will hear them. And you want the devil to hear you say it. You've got to be bold about it. When Jesus spoke to the feed tree, he was bold about it. He did it in the hearing of all his disciples. He didn't say, you guys go over there and see if there's any fruit on that tree way over there. And they walk up here and whisper to the tree. Just to see, hoping maybe it might work. No, 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 no. He knew what he said was going to work. He said, the words that I speak, he said, they're spirit, they're alive. They're alive. And they work. His faith was always working. His faith never failed. God wants us to get to the point that our faith is always working. It never fails. It never stops working. Amen. Hallelujah. Because I'm telling you something, folks. That's exactly what the devil wants. He wants to, to, to you to react in such a way that your faith stops working, okay? That's the reason if you're ever given a diagnosis, a bad report, immediately, listen to me carefully, immediately, what you do at that moment determines what's going to happen next. At that very moment, let's just say a very, I mean, extreme case. You've been having all kinds of symptoms in your body. You go to a doctor, the doctor runs some tests. He says, I've got to get you to a, a major hospital. He moves you somewhere else. They run more tests. doctor comes in, and he's just got this terrible frown on his face. You can see the gloom, the doom. And he says, Mr. So-and-so, I am sorry to tell you this, but you have stage four cancer, and you have at the very most three months to live. What you do at that moment determines whether you're going to live beyond those three months or not. It's not what the doctor is going to do. It's not his plans. It's not his treatments that determine. It's what you say at that moment that determines how long you're going to live. At that moment, you need to know, I shall not die, but live and declare the works of the Lord. Amen? I'm telling y'all what, folks, this is a good preaching right here, whether you like it or not. <laughs> Glory to God. Amen. Hallelujah. Say it out loud, I shall not die. I shall not die. But I will live, I will live. And, I will and I will declare the works of the Lord. Of the Lord. Praise God. Folks, you ought to wake up every morning and just begin to say, this is the day the Lord has made. I'm going to rejoice and I'm going to be glad. I'm going to live healthy. I'm going to live whole. Uh, a whole life, a, a, every part, every wet hole. I'm going to live blessed today. I'm going to prosper today. I'm going to be free from fear and worries today, free from sickness and disease. Yeah. Amen? Amen? 
Why? Because the Lord is on my side and he's with me and my faith is working. Look at Matthew 13, verse 20. In Matthew 13, verses 20 and 21, in the parable of the sower, Jesus said, He that received the seed in the stony places, the same as he, he heard the word, and anon, or immediately with joy, he receives it. Everybody got that? He heard the word. With a heart full of joy, he received the word, right? Yet. Everybody say yet. Yet, yet hath he not root in himself, but dear for a while, for when tribulation, ellipsis, pressure, when it comes or persecution arises, because of the word, by and by, he is offended. Now notice, he received the word as soon as he heard it, but it didn't last long. You know why? Because he didn't develop any roots in himself. And because he didn't develop any roots in himself, nothing was being produced in his life. I always remember this. Seeds do not come with roots attached. When you buy the seed, listen to me, the seed has to be planted and then it begins to develop roots. You have to take the seed of God's word and you have to endure. As a matter of fact, next week I'm going to talk to you about some of the ingredients that you must mix with your faith and endurance is one of those things. When you're in the midst of a storm, when you're facing a challenge, You've got to make your mind up that I am going to continue long enough for roots to develop in my heart. The seed of God's word must develop roots on the inside. That is what causes you to grow stronger and stronger in your faith. Now, notice this. He didn't last long. After tribulation came. After the tribulation, after the pressure came... And it came because of the Word of God. It came because of the Word. Right? And the Bible says by and by he's offended, which means that he got tripped up and he stumbled. He got knocked off balance. That's the whole purpose of Satan coming at you, is to knock you off balance. For those of you that are are making the confession, Lord, I want to be blessed because I want to be a blessing. Well, let me tell you something. The devil doesn't want you to be a blessing. He doesn't want you to be blessed with your own personal life. He doesn't want you to be a blessing to your family. He doesn't want you to be a blessing to your local church, to the kingdom of God, to the mission work in Haiti, or to the building fund, or nothing else. So he's going to do everything he can to knock you off balance. He wants you to get offended by something. Pressure coming. Persecution. People making fun of you. Family will say, well, I ain't tell you your problem taking all that money and giving that church down there. You ever heard stuff like that before? You ought to be saving that money. That's the world's way. I said, that's the world's way. That came out of Babylon, in case y'all don't know. Buying and selling is the world's way. It is the world's economy. But giving, listen to me, and receiving, sowing seed, tithing, that's God's way. Now, I didn't say anything wrong with saving, did I? But I'm saying if that is your focus, then it's wrong. That man got offended. 1 Peter 2, verses 7 and 8. 1 Peter 2, 7 and 8. Now, to those of us that believe, Jesus is precious. Everybody say, I believe. I believe. And to me, he's precious. Now watch, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed or rejected, the same is made the head of the corner. Next verse. A stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereto also they were appointed. Now, precious just simply means to be highly valued, okay? But that word disobedient there comes from the Greek word apatheo, and it means not to allow oneself to be persuaded. Y'all remember the king that told uh, Paul, almost thou persuadest me? He wouldn't allow himself to be fully persuaded. He was disobedient. It means not to comply with or to disobey. People stumble at the word. I remember, I'm thinking about one a woman in particular, years and years ago, she would talk about her financial problems and every time 
that I would counsel her with her about with her. I would ask her, "Are you tithing?" And she would say every time, "I can't afford to tithe." And I would tell her, "That's your problem. Your problem is that you are disobedient." You're not doing what God's Word said to do. She refused to allow herself to be persuaded that if she tithed, that God would open the windows of heaven and pour out blessings on her and rebuke the devourer for her sake. So how do y'all, you know all of this so good? Number one, the Word. Number two, I did it, and guess what? It works. I know first of all because of the Word, second of all because I obeyed the Word and it worked in my life. And it'll work in your life. When I started tithing, I think if I'm not mistaken, I was bringing, I, I, I had a, I think it was a gross check of $110 a week. Gross now. But I tithe and I started giving. You say, well, how much do you give? Well, folks, listen, when you only got $110 a week and you live by yourself and you're paying your bills and you tithe, there's not a whole lot left. And there were times when there was nothing left, but I would give a dollar or two dollars or something like that. And there were literally times when I had nothing left, but God provided supernaturally. God always provided supernaturally. And then not only that, he began to promote. Promotion comes from the Lord, folks. How many of you want promotion in your life? The psalmist said promotion doesn't come from the north or the south. Come on, y'all. I mean, from, from the, it doesn't come from the east or the west or the south. But he didn't mention the north. Why? Because God lives in the north. It comes from the north. Promotion comes from God. Promotion comes from above. Promotion begins at the house of God. Just like judgment begins at the house of God, promotion begins at the house of God. Do you hear what I'm saying? Judgment begins at the house of God. God cleans you up. And at the same time, promotion begins because now he's, he wants to lift you up. He wants to promote you. And so God began to promote me. And it's been going on ever since. He's promoting us now more than ever. It'll never stop. I said it'll never stop. Oh, God. I'm telling y'all, I, I love this. Romans 4, 3, the Bible says Abraham believed God. Do you believe God? Yes. Believe comes from the Greek word P-I-S-T-I-S, pistis, and it literally means persuasion or conviction of the truth. Faith is, listen to me, believing, it is a persuasion. It is a conviction of the truth. God's word is truth. Now, I'm going to tell you all something right now. Your faith will stand good for what you're hoping for. Amen. Do you hear what I said? The Holy Ghost said that to me today, and I wrote it down. Your faith will stand good for what you're hoping for. Amen. Now, watch this. Hebrews 11, verse 1. I know you're familiar with this. Faith, pistis, now faith is the substance of things hoped for. The substance of things hoped for. Substance comes from a Greek word, hypostasis, and it literally means a standing under. Everybody got that? Hypostasis means standing under. Faith is that conviction, remember, persuasion of the truth. So basically, he's saying that faith is a conviction based upon hearing and is standing under what you are hoping for. Let's just take for by way of illustration. Let's say you just have a used car you want to sell, and it's a good car, nothing wrong with it. I know you very well. I trust you. I also know another guy very well, and I trust him. I tell him about it. He wants to buy it. And so the two of you don't know each other. You don't know him. He doesn't know you. But I know both of you very well, and I trust both of you, right? And so I pick you up. You say, I want to buy that car. I take you over to his house to look at it. We get there. He comes out. And he says, oh, man, I wish you to call first. I, I left it at the shop to have it, you know, tuned up and plugs put in, had the oil changed. You got the check already. You already know what he wants for it. You got the check made out to him. And so uh, he tells you all about the car. He's got the title deed. He's ready to sign it over to you. You got the check made out. So he pulls me over to the side. He says, um, can I trust him? 
Yeah, you can trust him. He says, is that check good? Yeah, that check's good. I know him. I believe him. I trust him. That check's good. Well, you want to know. You think that car's what he said? I, yep. I trust him too. I believe that car is everything he told you. What am I saying? Listen to me. I'm standing good for you that the car is everything he said it is. I'm standing good for him that the check is good as well. Y'all with me so far? What am I doing? Faith is standing under, standing good for what you are hoping for until it shows up. Now, don't get me wrong. Hope and faith is not the same thing. Hope takes the unrealities, the things that you're hoping for. Faith turns it into realities. So faith takes the unrealities of hope and turns it into realities. You got that? That's what faith does. Hope says, I'm going to get it one day. I'm hoping for it. I believe God's going to. Faith says, no, I know what God promised. I've already prayed. I've already acted on the word. I believe I received. It's mine. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. Then he says it's the evidence of things not seen. My faith in God, my trust in him is the proof. It is the evidence. It is the title deed of things you can't even see. Things not seen. The evidence of things not seen. So you could actually buy that car and get the title deed and go home and show it to your wife and say, look at what I bought today. Well, what does it look like? Well, I'm not sure. He told me the color and all this kind of stuff. You, what? You mean you bought a car you hadn't even seen it? Yeah. Well, how do you know it's yours then? Because I got the title deed. Right? See, the title deed's right here of all the promises of God. So I know that God is with me. I know that he's going to bring me through. I want to close with a back at chapter 3, verses 17, 18, and 19. I'm going to pick up later talking about Abraham, but I don't want to press it tonight. It's already getting late. You've got kids, got to go to school and all that. And jobs, I know a lot of you get up early. So let's close with this. I want to encourage you to have the attitude that you see and hear in these verses of 17, 18, and 19. The prophet of God makes this statement. Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall fruit be in the vines. The labor of the olive shall fail. The field shall yield no meat, no provision. The flock shall be cut off in the fold. There shall be no herds in the stall. Boy, that sounds mighty bleak, doesn't it? Yet, everybody say yet. yet. I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord is my strength, and he will make my feet like hinds feet. He will make me to walk upon my high places to the chief singer on my string instrument. In other words, let's shout and get the praise music out. Hallelujah. Why? Because no matter what it looks like, my God is with me. He's going to bring me through. He's going to bless me. He's going to provide for me. I am not going to get down and out. I refuse to be depressed. I am pressing on because I know my God is for me. Hallelujah. How many of you know God's for you? I say, you know God's for you. Is there anybody here you believe in God for something? Raise your hand if you are. Anybody here believe in God for anything? I see some hands. All right? Now, if you don't want to do it right now, make sure sometime tonight, write it down. And then as soon as possible, find every scripture you can pertaining to that and begin to personalize those scriptures. Out loud, begin to say them. This is talking about me. This is mine. This is what God says about the situation. I agree with God. I refuse to say what the circumstances say. I refuse to repeat according to my emotions or my feelings or the circumstances or the test and all that kind of stuff. This is what God says. I agree with God, period. No buts, ands, or ifs, right? right. Hallelujah. This is very important. I want every one of you to overcome, to overcome, to be winners and triumph in everything that you do. Joshua, can I pray for you? Come on down here. Anybody else, you won't pray real quickly. I believe the anointing is in this place. Hallelujah. And the yoke destroys every, listen to me, the, burden, the anointing destroys every yoke, removes every burden. Y'all stretch your hands out. Father, in the name of Jesus, I just thank you. As I looked at this young man, 
I believe that you led me to lay my hands upon him. I believe your word. I'm acting upon your word as I feel led by your Holy Spirit. I believe that as soon as I touch him, that the anointing is going to destroy every bondage, every yoke of the devil in his life. You are the God of restoration. You are of God, not just of the second chance or third chance, but the God of how many chances a man may need. And we're believing right now, Lord. I believe that he's here tonight because in his heart he desires to walk with you, to know you, to be free, to serve you, to be blessed, to be a blessing. I believe, Father God, that the blood of Jesus cleanses from all sin. I believe, Father God, that the anointing right now cleanses him, spirit, soul, and body, every whit whole, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Thank you, Lord, for the anointing. I break the power of the devil, Satan. I rebuke you. I break your power off of his life right now. Satan, you are under our feet in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And as he has confessed Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior, he is a child of God. Devil, I rebuke you. I resist you in Jesus' name. Father, I plead the blood over his spirit, over his soul, over his body, every, every part in the name of Jesus. And I pray, Lord, that he'll be sanctified, spirit, soul, and body into the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Give him strength, Father God. Strengthen him by your spirit in his inner man. Help him, Father God, to make wise choices, wise decisions. I sever every relationship in his life that's not of you in the name of Jesus. And I believe, Father God, that as he joins with me in severing those relationships in the name of Jesus, that you're going to bring new friends into his life. Oh, Father God, that he'll be surrounded, oh, by the holy angels of God, directing him, Lord, directing him, directing his path. Thank you, Father God, for ordering his steps in Jesus' name and opening doors for him an opportunity, Lord, that he'll be wise, 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 in Jesus' name. Others may have given up on you, saith the Lord, but not I. I would never, ever give up on you, and I will be with you. If only you call upon my name, you will sense my presence and my power to be with you that moment, for I am a present help in time of need. Look to me. Lean on me. Draw from me. My grace is sufficient for thee, saith the Lord in Jesus' name. Glory to God. Glory to God. We worship you, Lord. We worship you, Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. The Lord is good, amen? I hope this is helping y'all and preparing you. Neil, come on real quickly. Turn around here. Thank you, Lord. Just lift your hands to the Lord. Father, I praise you in the name of Jesus. I thank you, Lord, for the anointing to minister to our brother right now. If I know that you're doing a work in him, Father God, as a babe in Christ, I praise you, Lord, for giving him such a hunger for the milk of the word. Give him understanding. Give him revelation. May his eyes be open to see the truth of your word that in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, that he may know the hope of your calling, that he may know the inheritance of the saints in light, the exceeding greatness of your power toward everyone that believes. I thank you, Father God, for working in him to do according to your will, according to your purpose, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Oh, we praise you, Father God. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. Y'all join with me if we pray over the youth group real quickly. Father, we, we just stretch our hands out right now toward these young people, these young men and women in the youth group tonight. I thank you, Lord, for David and Caitlin being willing to lead them, to teach them, to minister to them. And, Father, the others that are helping. But right now, Father God, I plead the blood of Jesus over each one of these young men and women. I know, Father God, that they are dealing with things in their lives that maybe somebody, uh, that parents might not know about, others might not know about. But you know everything. You see everything. And I ask you, Father God, to deliver them from every attack of the enemy. Strengthen them. Help them. Oh, Father God, sever the, the people, other people in their lives that are trying to bring them down. 
Father God, connect them with other godly young men and women their age that will build one another up, Lord. I plead the blood of Jesus over them. No matter where they go, at school, at the mall, or anywhere else, no weapon formed against them shall prosper. We decree it in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And I pray that their eyes will be open to the truth of your word and of your way. And Father, that they will begin to look to the future. They'll look to heaven for direction. And Lord, they'll not waste time. They'll not make terrible mistakes. Help them, Father God, to choose wisely their friends and the things that they allow into their hearts, into their lives. In Jesus' name, we commit them unto you, into your keeping. Amen. Praise God. We love you.